Thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak on this topic. Uh, today, I will be hoping to review some of the early evidence for TNT, as well as the results of uh, our program that we instituted in 2019. Over the last 30 years, there have been considerable advances in the management of advanced rectal cancer. Um, things like the institution of neadjuvant radiation, improvements in the type and quality of radiation like IMRT, which allow us to give a higher dose to the primary tumor, as well as advances in surgical technique and a focus on reducing the rates of positive margins, uh, have resulted in a dramatic reduction in local recurrence from 30% 30 years ago to 5% today. Unfortunately, however, this dramatic reduction in local recurrence has not necessarily translated to an equivalent reduction in, the, in overall survival. Um, in fact, approximately 30% of patients in Australia with rectal cancer still die of distant metastatic disease uh, within the five-year mark. So this summarizes the treatment pathway for locally advanced rectal cancer. Typically, we start with neadjuvant radiation, either long course or short course, and then we undertake surgery after a, a wait period of about eight to 10 weeks. Um, and then after surgery, after an undefined period of time, depending on surgical recovery, patients will have adjuvant chemotherapy. And then if they have an ileostomy, this needs to be closed. Now this process takes a long time. It can be up to a year or more in some patients. And during that period of time, lots of things can go wrong. And in fact, one of the uh, well understood and documented drawbacks of this strategy is that a significant proportion of patients never get their chemotherapy, either due to complications of the surgery or because um, after, at the end of radiation and surgery, the patients are sort of fed up with being in hospital and the toxicity associated with it, uh, and they uh, decline to have chemotherapy. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, the survival benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy for rectal cancer has been pretty limited compared, say, for example, with colon cancer. This is a good example of this. In 2018, we looked at the outcomes of pelvic exenteration at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. So these were patients that by definition had pretty aggressive tumors uh, that were invading adjacent organs and therefore required a pelvic exenteration. Um, and we found that when we looked at this subset of patients, one of the issues was that despite them having fairly aggressive biology, uh, about 30% didn't get any chemotherapy. And that's because the complication rate from the exenteration part of the surgery was so high that they never really got to their uh, chemotherapy. And we identified this as an area of concern and that it might be somewhere where we could be doing better. So one way to achieve this would be to move the chemotherapy before the surgery. This is termed total knee adjuvant therapy in the sense that all the radiation and the chemotherapy is delivered in its entirety uh, in the knee adjuvant setting pre-op. And it just so happened that around the time we were looking at this problem, uh, the seminal papers on TNT were published in 2018 from Memorial Sloan Catering. Um, so the data was starting to come out showing the potential benefits of TNT. So in this phase two study uh, from MSK, the patients were divided into four groups. Group one had standard care, long course surgery and adjuvant chemo. Um, and then groups two, three, and four had increasing amounts of neoadjuvant chemotherapy or TNT. And what was interesting in this study is that even though the baseline risk factors were the same, the disease-free survival was much better in any of the TNT groups versus the standard of care group, and it improved slightly with increasing doses of chemo. So since that phase two trial, there have actually been three high-quality randomized controlled trials that have completed recruitment, one of which was recently published, and the other two have been presented in abstract form and will be published soon. And they're all pretty consistent. They show high rates or higher rates of clinical response and higher rates of disease-free survival. And because of this consistency, this has led to a call recently suggesting that TNT in some form may become the standard of care in rectal cancer. Uh, but there are some uh, issues that remain that need to be addressed, which I will uh, discuss later on in the talk. So to summarize uh, the potential benefits of TNT, really the main benefit, uh, we think, is improved compliance with, with chemotherapy. So more of the patients will get chemotherapy, and this then translates to higher rates of complete response and an improved disease-free survival. There is another benefit which is not discussed very much, which is less time with an ileostomy. Because there's no chemotherapy after surgery, uh, you can go on to close the ileostomy whenever you see fit, and you don't have to necessarily wait until adjuvant chemotherapy is done. 
there are some potential drawbacks, and the main one is more people are getting chemotherapy, and that's associated with cost and potentially toxicity. There's also an unresolved issue as to whether we should be giving chemotherapy or radiation first. Uh, while there might be a higher uh, complete clinical response with radiation first, some patients may also benefit from having chemotherapy first, particularly those with more advanced disease. So this German study was a randomized controlled trial that looked at this very question, um, and they compared induction chemotherapy versus consolidation chemotherapy with both arms having TNT. And the take-home message from the study is that compliance is better with whatever modality is used first. So if radiation is used first, then more patients will get radiation and vice versa. There were a couple of weaknesses of the study. Um, oxaliplatin was used with the long course, uh, which we don't use in Australia and New Zealand, uh, and in both groups, only three cycles of Folfox were given preoperatively, which is a little bit lower than what would be regarded as standard TNT. So in late 2018, we all sat together as a group at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and we looked at the data available at the time. And we realized that one type of TNT did not fit all presentations, and that actually a better approach would be to use both sequences of TNT, but to tailor the order to the disease biology at presentation. If we felt the patients had a higher risk of local recurrence, then they had radiation first, whereas if the patient had a higher risk of distant recurrence, then they had the chemotherapy first, because the compliance was best with whatever treatment is given first, and therefore it made sense that the most important treatment from a biological point of view should be front-loaded. So it's important to mention that the Royal Adelaide Hospital uh, TNT protocol was written and contributed to by a large number of people. Uh, obviously, all the uh, surgeons um, in the picture were involved, but also we had significant contributions from uh, a stellar group of radiation and medical oncologists that we work with. Um, they helped us to write the protocol and to implement it. Uh, we're quite lucky that we have um, a pretty cohesive group across both public and private sectors. And so we're able to roll this out across both sites simultaneously with ethics approval and prospective data collection. So to simplify the protocol, we basically, when a patient turns up to the Royal Adelaide or St. Andrews MDT with a rectal cancer, they are stratified into three groups, which are well understood based on the knee adjuvant treatment. So um, the patients with an early rectal cancer, T1 or T2, N0, um, the, we recommend surgery still for those patients. Uh, now, there is a small group of patients that have an early rectal cancer where uh, the cancer is very low and they decline surgery because they don't want a permanent stoma. Those patients are offered TNT, but we would still recommend surgery as the standard of care. Then we have the bad tumors. These, these are the ones that have a propensity for distant failure. So node positive tumors, uh, tumors with uh, resectable uh, liver or lung metastases, and tumor that have EMVI. Um, and finally, we have the ugly tumors. These are the exenteration type patients that have locally advanced T4 tumors. So this is the protocol for the uh, bad tumors. Um, it's, as you can see, it's pretty complicated. So I'll just remove some of the fat to make it easier to read. So if, they have, if we feel that they have distant failure risk, node positive, M positive, EMVI, et cetera, these patients get induction chemotherapy because we feel that the chemotherapy is probably the most important element of their care, given that they have a propensity to stage four disease. So they get the chemotherapy and that's eight cycles of Folfox um, or six cycles of Capox. Uh, then we wait two weeks, they have the long course, then we wait 10 weeks and they have surgery if they have not achieved complete clinical response. If there's a resectable liver or lung met, then that is dealt with in the wait period at the end prior to the definitive surgery being undertaken. The protocol for the ugly tumors, the bulky T4 tumors, um, as well as the ones that are early tumors but very low and the patients decline surgery, uh, that's radiation first. So those patients get long course or short course. Um, uh, we tend to give long course to these patients because we're aiming for um, downstaging. Uh, we wait two weeks, then they have eight cycles of Folfox or six cycles of Kpox. Then we wait another four weeks, and then we check for CCR. And if they haven't achieved CCR, they proceed to surgery. So this protocol has applied to all patients that were discussed at the Royal Adelaide or St. Andrews MDT since January 2019. And we've, had, we've kept uh, prospective data since that time. 
Um, 178 patients with rectal cancer were discussed at the MDT, and of those, 73 patients were eligible for TNT. And what I mean by that is that they had advanced rectal cancer and they were treated with curative intent. The rest either had early rectal cancer and had surgery or um, had uh, disease treated with palliative intent. Of the 73 patients, 66 actually got TNT. Six patients refused, refused chemotherapy, uh, and one patient deteriorated rapidly and was switched to palliative care before any treatment was started. Um, overall, a fairly young group of patients. There's a preponderance of males, as you would expect uh, with rectal cancer, um, and mostly primary rectal cancers, although there were a couple of recurrent rectal cancers in there as well. Um, a high rate of stage four disease, but all treated with curative intent. Uh, you can see there's a few stage one and two cancers here. Uh, some of these were really low early rectal cancers where the patients refused surgery and were given TNT, but a few were, you know, uh, threatened CRM, but node negative or T4 even and node negative, uh, um, and therefore were stage two technically, but had high risk features. And traditionally we would give those long course anyway. Um, a high rate of T4 cancers, fairly low tumors, a very high rate of EMVI, uh, as well as uh, a few patients with uh, lateral pelvic sidewall nodes. So for these 66 patients, uh, there were a higher proportion, approximately two thirds that had consolidation chemotherapy. In other words, had the radiation first and uh, a third of the patients had, uh, radi had chemotherapy first followed by radiation, uh, mostly long course uh, and a high proportion had Kpox or Folfox. One patient did have full theory um, for, because they weren't tolerant of oxaliplatin, uh, and the rest either had other regimens or uh, they're still having their radiation and were waiting to decide about the chemotherapy. The compliance with chemotherapy was very high. In fact, 97% uh, of patients had four or more cycles of uh, chemotherapy, which is much higher than the 70% we were getting before we started TNT. Only two patients uh, had less than four cycles of chemotherapy due to toxicity or intolerance. Um, there were four patients that had highly significant chemotherapy toxicity, but in general, it was well tolerated. Uh, those four patients, two, uh, one patient had febrile neutropenia uh, requiring ICU admission. Two, patient had, two patients had neutropenic colitis or enteritis, and one patient had a severe skin reaction. Uh, there were no deaths uh, related to chemotherapy. So for the most important part, I guess, at the moment for this talk, which is what is the response uh, to this treatment? So we've had 48 patients who have completed TNT and have been reassessed, have been restaged at the end of it, uh, of the 66 patients. Um, a staggering 52% of patients have had a complete response. The vast majority of these had a complete clinical response and didn't have surgery, including that uh, patient in the picture up the top there. Um, a couple of patients had still a residual ulcer and had surgery, but had no tumor in the specimen. So overall, the complete response rate was 52%. The rest of the patients all had a partial response. We did not have any patient that progressed in the pelvis uh, by radiology criteria. So all the tumors got smaller and some went away. We did have two patients where it was a circumferential tumor and as it shrunk and fibrose, the patients got obstructed and they had to be defunctioned during the treatment, uh, but they went on to complete their treatment. As far as the response at distant sites, uh, we had 15 patients that had stage four disease. 47% of these patients had no residual tumor detectable on imaging at the distant sites. 20% uh, of patients had a partial response and five patients or a third progressed on chemotherapy. Now, these were all patients that had induction chemotherapy. And so, you know, the, the first treatment they got was chemotherapy and they progressed despite that, um, and which resulted in a course correction either towards palliative intent treatment or changing the chemotherapy. But still quite a high rate of complete response. Now, there are some practical issues with TNT. Um, despite the, you know, we're, we're pretty happy with these outcomes, but there have been some issues which I think are worth mentioning. Um, it is a bit of a logistical dilemma. Um, the treatment process is long, and as surgeons, we're used to sort of doing the radiation and the surgery and then, you know, leaving the chemotherapy to the oncologist. But what's happening now is uh, the chemotherapy, because the chemotherapy is given before surgery, um, that creates some challenges in the sense that the treatment can be delayed, patients can miss cycles or, 
Uh, and so who coordinates all this communication and who collects the data? Because I do feel that these patients definitely warrant uh, prospective data collection. So we're lucky in that before we started the TNT, we had two people, Joe Perry and Tracy Fitzsimmons, who handled a lot of this for us. So Joe Perry is well known around South Australia. She's an amazing uh, cancer nurse, and she really v pretty much handles the coordination and the communication. Uh, Tracy is a relative newcomer to our team, but she's been doing all the data collection for us uh, prospectively. Um, because of the high rate of complete clinical response, uh, the surgery tends to get canceled, you know, two weeks before because, you know, we have to plan the surgery, the patient's booked on a list, and then when we restage them two weeks before the surgery, we find there's no tumor there, and therefore we find ourselves having to fill the list uh, at short notice as a result. And obviously, the high rate of complete clinical response results in a high rate of non-operative management or watch and wait, and those patients require a surveillance program, which is well established at the RAB, but the numbers are much higher than we're used to. And this creates some burden on the outpatient system. The patient psychology is interesting uh, because we, when we speak to them about TNT, we explain to them that there's a 50% potential uh, complete clinical response rate. The patients tend to expect that, and they're disappointed when it doesn't happen. And we've had a couple of patients refuse surgery at the end of all their treatment, because obviously now surgery is given at the end. And so we used to have a problem with compliance with the chemo. Now we have a problem to some extent with compliance with the surgery. And we have two pa we've had two patients decline surgery um, as a result of this. The disappearing liver metastases, um, to us as colorectal surgeons, that is not really a big issue. We're we tend to be quite happy when a patient who had liver metastases at diagnosis no longer has them. But the uh, surveillance program for, uh, for watch and wait for liver metastases is not as well established as it is for rectal cancer. And so um, we've had to have discussions with our liver unit as to, you know, how do we follow these patients up? Because the, the, the algorithms are not very clear. The amount of rectal cancer surgery we're doing at the RA in St. Andrews has halved since 2019 as a result of this program. And so the question is, are we doing enough rectal cancer? Um, to remain competent, given the volume has reduced so much. Um, there is a question as to whether giving chemotherapy upfront complicates the surgery. Um, I have to say that has not been a major issue in our practice, uh, but it is something to be aware of um, uh, going forward. There are some academic issues as well. Um, does TNT improve overall survival? We know it improves disease-free survival, but we don't know if it improves overall survival. We also don't know if it's cost effective, and we also don't know if a personalized approach is better than just picking one horse, either the induction or consolidation horse, and just sticking with that. So are we there yet? Is TNT uh, the new standard of care in 2021? My personal view is that we're not quite there. Um, I think we're in the early adoption phase. And the main reason I say that is because you know the data is not mature. There are still some issues that need to be clarified. Only one of the three uh, multi-center RCTs are published. Um, and so at the very least, we need to wait for that data before we can claim that this is the standard of care. Um, however, I, I will say that TNT is very promising. There is little question now that it improves disease-free survival and complete clinical response rates. And it probably will represent the future standard of care in some form. Until that time, however, I would suggest that uh, it is really incumbent upon us if we're going to be instituting TNT to get the proper ethics approval and collect the data so that we can actually assess what's happening to these patients, make sure we're not making any mistakes along the way, and just have a tighter control over what's going on and whether we're actually benefiting the patients. Um, one way to do this is to enroll the patients in the renal trial, which does allow um, TNT now. Um, and that is a trial focused on watch and wait, but that's particularly relevant to this group because a large number will get a complete clinical response. And therefore, it is, it is a good trial to um, kill two birds with one stone, get the proper ethics approval, collect high quality data, and at the same time, assist in recruitment to the Reno trial. So thank you very much for that. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks.